you know, I was teaching probably around 30 students a week at home and, but realized, you know, I think I come from a family of entrepreneurs and I always got to that stage of, well, this is not going to work long term necessarily. Like how can I create more impact, reach more students, educate to a higher level without burning out? And that is, I think, the challenge that so many music educators face. Welcome to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast, the place where teachers from around the world meet to share innovative ideas about music education. Listen and learn as we help you motivate your students, grow your income, expand your studio, and become a more creative piano teacher. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another edition of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. It's great to be back with you again for another chat with an inspirational teacher, from somewhere in the world and this time close to home up in Sydney, Australia. This is episode number 93 of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. And if you're one of my Inner Circle members, a special welcome to you. My name is Tim Topham and I'm the host of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. And this is the place to get your weekly dose of inspiration, fresh ideas and some new teaching or business strategies to help you grow the studio that you want. Today's show notes and a full transcript are available as usual at timtopham.com slash episode 93. A quick couple of reminders before we start. We're coming up to Piano Teacher Conference Month around the world. Yes, July seems to be when everyone decides to do their conferences. So if you're in Australia, look out for the APPC, the Australasian Piano Pedagogy Convention. It's being held at the University of Adelaide from the 10th to the 14th of July. It is four days chockers with masterclasses, workshops, performances, lectures, recitals, you name it. It's a veritable who's who of piano teaching from not just Australia, but with special guests from around the world. All the details are online and you can head to my Facebook page to watch a live video with Carly McDonald, one of the conference organizers. Just search for Tim Topham on Facebook and you'll be able to find it. And if you're in the United States, I'll be over there for three weeks from mid-July for the 88 Creative Keys workshops in Denver. And unfortunately, they are now sold out. But you can still catch me the week after from the 26th to the 29th of July when I'll be presenting at the National Conference on Keyboard Pedagogy in Chicago. To find out more and grab a last-minute ticket if you need one, head to keyboardpedagogy.org. I'll be giving a live workshop in the keyboard lab all about chords and harmony, rhythms, playing together. Should be great fun. And I'm really looking forward to meeting lots of teachers over there. And if you'd like to hang out, have a glass of wine, maybe get some food with other teachers who listen to this podcast at these events, then you can find out more about when we'll be getting together at timtopham.com slash meetup, M-E-E-T-U-P. Today's podcast is all about expanding and growing your studio with some strategies and tactics that you can use to nurture your new leads, new enrollments, and increase your retention all while you sleep. We're going to dive into today's episode now with an introduction to my guest who is just so much fun. I I guarantee this is going to be a fun interview. We're going to be talking all about expanding and growing your studio, given that we're in the middle of business month on the blog lots of strategies and tactics and finding out as well about what my guest herself has done in building her business. My guest is a teacher, educator, and entrepreneur who founded a successful performing arts studio while studying for her teaching degree. In just four years, it expanded to six venues across Sydney with a team of 35 teachers and more than a thousand students. She has sat on multiple performing arts boards here in Australia, including Music Count Us In, ABC's Sing Books, the School Spectacular, and the Arts Unit. And now through her company, Studio Expansion, she helps studio owners from every corner of the globe to attract more students, boost retention, and build a loyal team. Welcome to the podcast, Chantel Bruinsma Duffield. Thank you, Tim. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for having me. It's so good to hang out with you because I've seen as many, probably many of our listeners have you all over Facebook. You have got <laughs> so many <laughs> you've got so many great resources. You pop up all bubbly and chatty in my feed. I, I cannot help but click watch those videos. So thank you for all those uh, inspirational tidbits you give us online. 
Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. And, you know, I, I've, I have to say that we're so privileged to do what we do, Tim, because I just happen to believe that studio owners and particularly, you know, arts educators are just the most beautiful people in the world. They are so heart-based and they care so much about their kids and making their life easier is what I am driven to do so that they can do more of what they're best at, which is, you know, connect more kids with music and with the arts. And if we can achieve that, my gosh, the world will be a better place in my opinion. So here, here. very privileged. Well, you've definitely got everyone on side with that little opening remark. So that's a great start. Excellent. Now you're known very much for the work that you do, particularly with dance and performing arts studios, but I've also just learned that you're actually musically trained initially. Tell us about that quickly. I am. So I have my BMUS in music education and classical voice. I went to the Sydney Conservatorium of Music and, uh, you know, I remember my first days, you know, starting oral perception and all my harmony and ear training and being very, very scared as, as vocalists tend to have that terrible reputation of. And, um, you know, I, I myself taught privately at home for years and years and years. And um, it was interesting when I was at the con, I was in first year and I wanted to go and teach um, at a summer camp that, you know, I'd always done as a kid. It was a musical theatre camp. And I'd heard that this camp had shut down. I was like, well, that's just a tragedy. That's just a tragedy. And um, so when I was at the con, a friend and I, we decided, well, you know what, we should do it. We could do that. And so we just decided to put on a summer camp and we called it Born to Perform. And we ran, we got kids in and we got them singing, we got them dancing, we got them acting over five days. And they put on a beautiful showcase at the end. And it was such a lovely way to apply what I was learning in my music education degree at the con and, you know, still connecting with children. And that business then grew to six venues running every holidays in Sydney and having term time programs and beautiful teachers. And, and it was a wonderful way to really initially supplement my private vocal teaching income that I was doing at home, you know, with kids and adults one-on-one, this was a much more leverageable model that I loved and the impact it had was brilliant. So that's kind of how I got started, really. That's my background. There you go. So the genesis for what you do today actually came from your music teaching private teaching. Absolutely. Wow. I didn't know that. Absolutely. Yes. There you go. I was, you know, I was teaching probably around 30 students a week at home and, but realized, you know, I think I come from a family of entrepreneurs and I always got to that stage of, well, this is not going to work long term necessarily. Like how can I create more impact, reach more students, educate to a higher level without burning out? And that is, I think, the challenge that so many music educators face that we love the connection one-on-one and the transformation our students achieve, but as a business model, it's very capped. And so that's why, you know, looking at the model first is so important for, for many of us. And it's, it's what I also really respect in what you educate your your clients in, Tim, looking at group models to be able to get more, more impact. Absolutely. Yeah, cool. Well, look, we're going to come back to some of the strategies that you recommend for teachers a little bit later. But first, Perfect. I think you've just come back from the States, right? Yeah. So what were you doing over there? So we were running our, uh, our retreats for our client. We've got a, a wonderful program called Studio Evolution. It's a 12-month mastermind program for studio owners. And so we run our two-day event, which is high-level strategy and conversation and implementation of marketing and team and leadership and you name it across the board. And we t- dovetail that with our, um, our, master, our masterclass, two days kind of open event. So we had our 80 clients there attending that in Phoenix this time, which was, which was absolutely wonderful wonderful. So twice a year I go to the States and we deliver our private tuition days for our clients over there. And um, yeah, it's just a wonderful way to learn more about what's happening globally with our client base and and spend time with them. And so that's kind of the wrap up uh, of the year's worth of work that they do in their mastermind, which they do generally from their own homes, I assume. Yeah, we, we meet four times a year, actually. Right. So um, I go over twice in the 12 months, I go over twice and we do these big events. And then we have mentors in the States who are able to connect with our mentors in person and the alternate kind of quarters. And then we have every week, we have, you know, three calls happening a week where we're coaching and mentoring our program, our clients in, in growing their businesses, particularly. Wow. So it's, cool. it's beautiful. It's very mm. cool. Very cool. <laughs> so look, you've been working in the industry for some time now. What's been yeah. the biggest change you've seen in the studio marketing landscape specifically in the last, let's say five years? 
Oh my goodness. So from the days when I started Born to Perform, Tim, like, you know, you you probably remember the days, like literally you would put an ad in the school newsletter and the students would come as if by magic. <laughs> it was just this miraculous, miraculous thing. And you would Chantel's just... Chantel's now dan- dancing around the room. I guess, with the arms I guess. The <laughs> <laughs> I guess so I'm, I'm a conductor at heart. You are. And, you know, so, you know, it's it was this what has shifted so dramatically from, you know, I, I started Born to Perform in 2005. And so that was, your first, that was the years, studio we were talking about before that you yeah, built Yeah, Born up. to Perform. Yep. Yeah, that was the Kids Performing Arts, Born to Perform. T- 2005 is when I started. I was a wee young thing of like 20, to give you a little heads up. And um, so what happened was that in those days it was so much a local marketing, you know, having a website was, you know, a desirable but not everyone had one back in those days and the shift that's the predominant change is that now we don't just run businesses or studios we have to become proficient in online marketing so where we used to just you know you could just slap up a website and again you would just hope people would come now we have to be learning strategies in facebook advertising and in email database management and in lead generation and, and seo and traffic and the whole dynamic of running a studio has shifted away from being an educator at heart who runs a business to really embracing more of our entrepreneurial desires. And for many studio owners, that can be a bit of a internal juggle. You know, it can really to, because it's so overwhelming, the volume and how do we do it and what, what do I have? It's, it's like gray <laughs> hair. It's gray hair central. So yeah, that, that's the main shift I've seen. It's that we've, in terms of the competition for dollars in our local communities, we have to become savvier in attraction to be able to have consistency of new student volume. That's that's the biggest one I see, Tim. Mm. I mean, no, it makes makes a lot of sense. But that that leap, of course, to online marketing is massive, right? For yeah. for most teachers, particularly uh, my audience, many of whom have been teaching for many years, yes. uh, and perhaps have started to see more struggles as the landscape is shifting around them potentially. So. Mm. I know it's a big question, but how do you initially get over that hump for teachers yeah. who are kind of settled and, and really it's just such a massive leap to move oh, forward completely. into that online marketing stuff? Completely. Well, there's a few places to start. I mean, the first place to not start is Facebook ads because that will just do your head. So, like, let's just <laughs> I take I hate a- Facebook ads. <laughs> yeah. You'll learn to love them. I, oh. I do they, they can they change your business so yeah. like you love the results that they get but I agree with you you want yeah. to outsource that pretty soon but in the <laughs> early days one of the first things that we encourage you to put in terms of technology into the business is an automated lead follow-up system a nurture sequence is what I like to teach okay you and tell us so what this that means quickly I will because yeah. <laughs> this will change your life so imagine at the moment like the most most of you guys would probably have experienced that you might get an email inquiry hi um, my little Tina is interested in starting piano lessons she's eight she's never done lessons before da, 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 da. and you get this through the contact us section of the website and then what happens then is usually in a perfect world you'll finish teaching at nine o'clock at night and you're shattered and you might pour yourself a little glass of wine and you'll write back to tina's mum and say sure why don't you come for a class da, 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 da. but what can also happen is that oh you had a something happen and you're a bit tired you get to it the next day sometimes and you write back but you don't hear back from tina's mum And so, you know, we've got this hole in the bucket, if you like. And so one of the biggest challenges that we see from studio owners is then you've kind of written back, but then again, there's no follow-up. So we've got no, no way of kind of just dripping and just kind of tapping them on the shoulder until they come back. So one of my favorite things that just changes businesses entirely and just makes your life a lot easier is we put into place this automated nurture sequence. And what this is, is a series of emails that's connected to the back end of your website. So imagine Tina's mum writes, hi, Tim, I want to kind of send Tina for music lessons. Automatically, straight away, there is this beautiful, beautiful email that gets sent to them straight away saying, hi, um, Mergefield inquirer's name. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And then says, thank you so much for reaching out. It's a pleasure to be able to hear from you. We can't wait to find out more about Mergefield Tina and what they are looking for in their classes. Um, we're going to be getting back to you as soon as possible. In the meantime, we would love for you to let us know a little bit more about Tina. Has she done lessons before? What type of music does she like? Da, 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 da. Now the intention here is very, very specific. 
Most people think that when they respond to an email inquiry for a potential student, they want to share information. Sure, our classes are this amount. We Here is the location. Um, this is what you need to bring. It's like they respond and we hit them with an, with an information blah, in the face, yeah? Mm-hmm. I want to flip that because I know that from a, a conversion perspective, if we can engage that inquiry in connecting with why they're looking for and helping them to feel cared for, helping them to feel like – you're interested in their child. I mean, that's everything. So even while you're still teaching, Tina's mum has sent the inquiry and straight away there's this email saying, tell me a little about Tina. What do parents like to talk about most? <laughs> their children. Kids, yeah? yeah, their kids. So this is starting as opposed to just kind of emailing them information, we're entering into a dialogue with that parent and we're showing them straight away then when you do go to respond, because you will, but we're buying you some time. This is your backup plan, yeah? Well, ultimately, so you actually haven't done anything yet. You have. We have not touched. You might be asleep when this is all going on. This is the dream. Yeah. This is the dream. So then Tina's mum writes back saying, oh, you know, she just loves jazz. She loves jazz, da 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 tells her about it. She's a bit shy, da 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 never done lessons before, da 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 Anyway, so that does give you some more information then. Let's say day three. So they've sent the email inquiry on day zero and then we've sent this lovely connection back. Then there's like a whole sequence we follow, but then we might send an email saying, here are the top three FAQs that a parent asks when they're wanting to send their child to piano. And then we answer them. We kind of, what are their biggest fears? What are the things you get asked the most? And again, we might direct them from that email back to your website to a beautiful, like maybe it's you, Tim. Maybe it's like, hi, my name's Tim and I just want to welcome you to Tim's studio. Uh, We're so passionate about helping each of our students to be able to perform with confidence and to really fall in love with music, da-da-da-da-da. And so then they get to connect with you again. You know, I, I see that the biggest opportunity that so many music educators leave on the table is that they're trying to sell their lessons and what they do as opposed to trying to connect with what the people are looking for and helping them to build that relationship early on. And that is the joy of marketing. That's the joy of marketing. So through this beautiful sequence of emails that we kind of, it's just little taps on the shoulder, little taps on the shoulder because Tina's mum may have got, you know, something had a bad day at work and she forgot to get back to you. Having this sequence in place, this nurture sequence, it is your follow-up plan that's, got your back. And that is one of the first things that we can do to help bring more ease to running your business, increase the amount of conversions from inquiries. Because I would say, Tim, I don't know about you, what you've experienced, but I would say from looking at the numbers of most studios, if you look at the total volume of inquiries most studios get across a year and how many actually enroll, on average, we're looking about 40%. Okay. Like it's 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 a low statistic when you look holistically of everyone who just phoned or texted or emailed who actually came into the studio. So if we can increase that to a 65, 70% conversion, you are winning. Absolutely. And a lot of it, a lot of it is just managing the communication. And if we don't ask, we don't tap them on the shoulder, we lose them. And you've done all that work promoting and word of mouth awareness to get them to your website, to get them to email you. We will, they're gold. Mm. And, you know, they are gold and I always kind of like to to phrase it in the way that you know if we make on average like let's say we're making $150 a month per student kind of conservatively yeah Mm -hmm. so in a year that's what $1,700 $1,800 something like that so every inquiry in so many ways is worth $1,800 to you and so it's like you know it's worthwhile putting a system in place so that we're just welcoming more I love it. And it it could be seen as counterintuitive because I know a lot of studio owners will have call me, here's my phone number on there, thinking probably that that's actually far more personal. But you're actually, you're encouraging people to realize that you can do far more with email because you can automate so much of it. That's right. And and I, I'm totally with you where I, I don't necessarily think that I, I believe phone calls are incredibly powerful for conversion, for connection, for enrollment. But, you know, Often we'll call someone back, we'll leave a voicemail and then they'll disappear into the the wilderness. We'll never hear from these people again. And it's 
And what can you do? So unless we have a way to consistently kind of invite them and connect with them, and then we might send a beautiful email. Like what I love to do with clients, we often film a video like, hi, welcome to the studio. Let me show you around. So here's where you're going to park. And then we actually go into the studio. We we show them the space so that before they've even come through the door, they've got an idea of like, hey, look, here's the beautiful waiting room. And, you know, here's where you're going to go in for your piano lesson. And look, there's Sarah. Like she's one of our teachers here. You can meet her, da 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 You know, that's that's the the level of you can have all of that automated and it doesn't have to be impersonal. It doesn't have to be cold. You can really put so much sparkle and wow factor into communicating what, what you're all about and have it totally on autopilot, which is <laughs> it's great. joy of joys. It makes so much sense, Chantel. And I think we're all beginning to realize now that video is actually pretty easy to do uh, with yeah. smartphones, the video side of it. We can, we can all do that, although even though we might not be comfortable being in front of a camera, uh, I mm-hmm. think you're right. It makes a huge difference, that personal connection. What about the actual setup? Without going into too much detail, obviously, because I know it's another whole topic, but you've got <laughs> so many different software solutions that will mm-hmm. allow you to do these automatic, automatic emails. What do you actually recommend your studio owners do to start this? Look, I'm a big advocate for low budget things. I think, you know, (laughs) you know, you don't need to spend a fortune and you up level as your business grows. So look, I MailChimp has a free providing, you know, it's a fantastic service. You can grow quite well with it, but it's free to begin with. So, I mean, we tend to sell our clients to check that out first. And then as they do grow in the business and they want more sophistication of automation and of complexity. So in terms of segmenting and kind of, you know, we can have you can have a lot of fun. Yeah. But right now, check out Mailchimp is probably my yeah. Go Fantastic. have a look at that. Let's you can do a lot if great. that helps. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. It, yeah. Well, look, and I mean, it comes right. We've almost got to take a step further back because I know for a fact that there's plenty of teachers out, studio teachers out there who don't have a good website or a website. <laughs> yes. Oh, I know. And so I've got to ask the next question, which is. What are you recommending for your teachers as the best place to start again, start simple without costing too much, without Mm -hmm. taking months to learn to build a website? Look, there's a lot of different schools of thought out there. You know, I tend to look at those free website builders like Wix and things like that. And and I know that they can be really good, but they, they all kind of smell like free website builder. You know what I mean? Like they all look a little dodge. Um, so, I want us to present professionally and I want us to build something that is going to reflect the quality that you are. So I really endorse WordPress, having a WordPress-based website. You can get like my website, for example, is WordPress with a theme. The theme is $69. It's called Jupiter. You can look it up. Um, It's a $69 theme. And that's essentially like imagine the WordPress is like, the mannequin and then you put the theme is the dress that you put on on it so you pay 69 bucks to get this pretty easy theme with the page builder you shove a a couple of photos in you write some beautiful compelling engaging text with lovely descriptions about what the student in the from the student's perspective don't just talk about they'll go in tempo and pitch and dynamics do not that does not connect the average parent has no idea what tempo is we need to be speaking their language and what their aspirations and intentions are for their child so my best advice is start with wordpress it's free you can have free themes as well um, and then usually i would just encourage you to you know i do believe that you know having a website is a cost of doing business in this day and age it is essential it is imperative and If you don't have a good website, I mean, I don't know if you're like the same like me, Tim. Like if I'm looking for a new hairdresser, I will literally pull up six hairdressers in the area and I'll just delete them based – I'll close the tabs based on their crappiness of website, yeah? It's pretty It's it's how I choose hotels and stuff like that as well. Yeah. It's everything. (laughs) And, and, And rest assured they're doing it for our websites too. Literally, hmm. they are going to our websites and going, mm, nope. So literally, it's like the website that connects wins. Yeah, it's true. So the more you can have video connecting and have language that talks about the opportunities and the progression and what, what you know, they're seeking and having, you know, photos of the students and the space. I mean, that's that's what's going to give your business the edge that's going to help people feel 
Like you're the person they want to go to because that's we're selling in many ways. We're selling relationships. We're not necessarily selling classes here. They've got to trust you. So we need to be transparent in our website so that they can feel the trust. I mean, what you've said to him, like you've seen watching heaps of my videos, like you even said when I got you, like, I feel like I know you. And we've only met today, yeah, you know, right. but but there's so much power with your website to be able to educate. Like, why not have a beautiful little warm-up activity where you're sitting there on the piano and saying, Let me just show you a little warm-up you can do right here, right now. And you just start here, and here's a good little, you could do a few different levels, but how lovely they could see your teaching style. How lovely. Like, wouldn't that be my gosh? Yes, I feel comfortable sending my kid to that teacher. Mm. Easy to do. Easy to do. Part of the service that uh, I offer my members is actually giving them a website critique, and you've hit the nail on the head. I think it's so important. Two things, just crucial testimonials from Uh parents with smiley faces and pictures of kids, preferably at the instrument or holding awards of some sort. Uh, th- yes. Those two things alone can really sell a business. It's a winner. Yeah. A winner. And you know my other pet peeve, if we can go into like what, what, I, what annoys me on websites? Let's do it. Is, yeah, let's go there. So dead ends, like studios with dead end websites. So I'll go to their homepage and there'll be a lovely picture, there'll be a lovely description and I'll scroll down and then I just get the footer. And I always kind of teach the analogy of like your website is like a roadmap and each page is essentially leading them to another street. So to kind of navigate them through what you want them to know and understand to be able to make an educated decision about choosing you. So if you think about it, like we might go to your program page about your lessons, but then there's no call to action saying click here to view our schedule, click here to enroll in your first class or click here to read our FAQs. So one of the biggest things, and you probably do the same thing, Tim, it's like every page must walk them to another level of knowledge to be able to know how to best guide that person to make the decision. And one of the the key things that we look at is their Google Analytics. So kind of find out like right now, what are people you looking at on your website? Are they going to are they all just going to your location page? Are they all looking at your pricing page? Do they go to their about us page? And when we know that, we can curate this lovely choreography or, or compose a melody. It's kind of like I always think it's like you know, if on a melody it goes la, 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 but on a website it could go la, 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 you know, because when they bounce, yeah? yeah? The intention is to go go this like this page, 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 enroll, yeah? But instead your website can go, go this page, this page, then there was no call to action telling them nowhere to go and they go off and you've lost it. I've never heard someone sing about conversions on websites, Chantel. No, no. That that is very special. It's it's, (laughs) – why thank you? Why thank you? But truly, it makes sense, yeah? Yeah, It's kind of know your end goal, know where you're directing the people on your website, know what you want them to do and how you are making explicit. Don't give them too many choices. Don't give them so many options. Make it so simple for people. One page, one thing. That's my advice. Yeah, one click, one call to action, one – Thing yeah. that you desire them to do, yeah, yes. yeah. I have to remember it myself when I when I put an email out that's got you know ten different things that people can click on, and it's like people will do nothing because it's too hard to choose. So to overwhelm, make yes. the decision for them. That's right. Just mm. keep it so simple: one email, one intention; one page, one intention. Mm. Lock it down. And you mentioned Google Analytics. Uh, we mm-hmm. should mention that's totally free software that Google provides once you plug in your website's address when you've got your website uh, it'll just start tracking everything that's going on with ridiculous levels of detail I don't understand how half the stuff works no you Uh, don't need to though I don't think but it is great for the you can find out where people are uh, where where they're coming from what device they're using what pages they're visiting they're kind of the crucial things that I I what at. the bounce page? I love that as well. What what page do people leave from? That's mm. a great thing to know. Like maybe they're all leaving from your FAQ. It's like okay, well, I just need to bring a bit of love to that page. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. I find but one it- thing that is super important with the Google Analytics is it doesn't work retrospectively. So like if you haven't got Google Analytics, please, please, please go and do that today because it only starts capturing the data from the day you install it on your website. So I always just like just make that this week's priority. Just get that, even if you don't look into the data. We just need to get it plugged in and capturing the information now. So jump on that. It's great. Uh, And I wonder whether there's one other thing that they could be doing now for the future. And I don't want, I almost don't want to say this because I don't want to freak people out, but should they be putting a Facebook pixel on their website in order to future track 
everything that's going Without on. Without doubt. And you can get a VA to do that for you. So if it's too scary, just get a virtual assistant to, and we can talk about that. But yeah, a pixel is essential. Again, again, this is the whole, this is your backup plan. Yeah, the pixel is a backup plan because right now people are going to your website and then they're bouncing off and they're going, nope, no, see you later. I've got no time to do this now. A Facebook pixel allows you to go, allows you to send ads to people who visited your website, even if you do it six months from now. Yep. It's another way of capitalizing on all that beautiful hard work you've done, getting them to your website in the first place. So 100%, Tim, 100%. Yep. All right. Now, you've, uh, this is just such a great conversation. You've mentioned virtual assistants now. Okay, uh, I am a, a huge fan, and I actually recorded a video of how I use Upwork to hire oh, people to help me. And so that's that's available for my members. Virtual assistants, just as a quick summary, are people around the world who are able to offer a service to people often online in their businesses, right? So where do you recommend teachers find virtual assistants and what kind of roles do you recommend they use it for? Because this is another awesome step for reducing your workload. Oh, my gosh. I'm so glad we went here. (laughs) It's the type of thing where once you start, you can't stop. It's so (laughs) addictive. And people say, what would I get a virtual assistant to do? And then then we get them one. And it's like, how did I live without one before? How did I I get through this running a business without it? Look, if you've never used a VA before, um, Upwork is a fantastic place to start. The other place I even just get people to kind of start exploring this whole concept is Fiverr. Are you, are you as in love with Fiverr as I am, Tim? Actually, I used to use it much more than I do now. So well, I did start it, there. Yeah. yeah, it's a great place to play with the idea of getting a project done as opposed to hiring an, a virtual assistant on a more retainer basis or mm. on a more bigger process, just start getting them doing little things and start kind of getting comfortable with delegating because I think that's the first step. You know, it's we have to feel trust in, in help getting people to help us and, you know, many of us are not very good at that. So, And, we um, don't, and you is, don't have to be a huge – you don't have to have multiple staff or a 1,000 students like you do. This is for any teacher, right? There are always jobs yes. that you shouldn't – well, you shouldn't have to do or you don't have to do, right? No, 100%. And things like putting a Facebook pixel, no one needs to do that. You don't need to do that. That's a little techie job that some very, very talented techie person can do. In about and it'll cost three you like minutes. Five bucks. Yeah. You know, it'll cost you five bucks. And the amount of time and gray hairs it will cost you to do it is just not worth it. <laughs> that's the equa- That's the cost equation. That I've been there so of. many times. Can you see, yeah. can you see my grades? No, I can't oh, see them at okay. all. Perfect, perfect, well. perfect. <laughs> <laughs> the Skype, Skype hides all for all. <laughs> so what are a couple of jobs that these VAs, virtual assistants, could oh do for gosh. us? Oh, my gosh. So th- even things like if you're doing, like, let's say, a Christmas concert with all your beautiful students, you know, get them to design the program. They, they can do that for you. It's things like scheduling social media. So what we like to help our clients do is we design a lovely little in Canva, which do you got like we love Canva? Yeah, you love your Canva. people know about that. Yeah. Okay, so in Canva we design a lovely little like testimonial graphic, let's say. And we literally kind of or a quote from you about like here are some tips for parents on how to help your child practice. We could do a beautiful series on parenting practice tips. And we do up one little template and then we just do a little Google Doc and we just slam out 52 little tips. And when you get in the, the zone of it, you they just fly. And then you get the virtual assistant to put them into the template in Canva. So we're getting all those consistency of the branding happening across the line. And then they can go and schedule them. Like we like to use Meet Edgar as our kind of social media schedule, whatever kind of program you're using. You know, they can go and input that all into your social media. So you're getting the consistency of marketing that, but you don't need to do it. Like yeah. it's, it's the low level tasks that we don't need to, we need to be thinking more from a leadership perspective on how is my time best invested and how can I work on creating a greater experience for our beautiful students without draining my time. I mean, you know, the other thing I want to just say is that, I mean, I'm not sure, you know, how many hours, how many classes a week would you say your clients are mainly teaching, Tim? What's kind of the average? What would you think? I would guess probably 20 to 30. The, the average would be about 30 students having a half hour or an hour each, I guess. So let's say 30, 40 hours. Do you know like how hard it is to run a business when you are doing that much face-to-face? I want to stand up and give you all a standing ovation because seriously, the the 
changing of the hats. Like, you know, when you are teaching, you're giving so much of yourself, you're completely focused on another person. And then you teach for 30, 40 hours a week. And then suddenly the flip heads into growing this business and to working on the admin. It's it's a real disconnect and it's exhausting, in fact. And I just want to say for all of you out there right now who are doing it, I just think you are supermen and superwomen and you deserve so much praise because it's not easy. And by helping you to do more of the delegation, the automation with technology, I mean, all these tools are at your disposal. They're all here at your fingertips, you know, and it will just make your life easier. And and that is what this is all about. It's allowing you more ease in your life so that you can do more of what you love. And that's, you know, whether that is teaching or whether it is working on growing the business more or developing your own curriculum, whatever it is, you know, we want to kind of streamline your life so that it's more fun. Mm, absolutely. And it is addictive. It is addictive. <laughs> so, yeah. So I, I think you've got, yeah, you've got a bit of a more recent systemization addiction by the sounds of things. And I want to get to that in just a moment. Um, yeah. Well, so look, we've covered a heap of ground already. We've talked about yes. conversion tactics with email sequences uh, and automation through that. We've talked about Google Analytics, making sure you've got a website that you can track what's going on on. We've talked about getting rid of those tasks that you shouldn't be doing and that someone else can do for you to save you time to focus on your business through virtual assistance. Mm. One thing I did want to ask you is about retention. So we've oh. talked about the conversion side. Let's flip it now because... As you know, or you and I, we both run businesses that have members that pay us for access to what we do. Uh, Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest issues that any subscription business has is churn when people Mm -hmm. decide to stop being a member. And that's that's the retention factor, right? It's absolutely crucial. You mentioned before the the bucket. If you're going to fill the bucket with all these great people coming in, but they're just pouring out the bottom, you're wasting your time. So it's a big topic. What, What about just one thing that you've seen really work for attention now? I might I might start back and then I might dive in. Is that okay? I might give a contextual outline. So w- when in my work, you know, as a teacher myself, and, you know, I worked as a primary school music teacher for, you know, quite a few years too. And so from a very educational perspective, I think retention is, it's the heart of what we do. It's, it's how our students you know, it's this is our results our students get. It's where our revenue lies. It's our reputation in our community. Our re- our retention is, for many, for my personal belief, it is the heart of our dis- decision making in the business. Every decision we make should either be contributing to retention or it's eliminated. That's kind of that's the depth of how I feel retention is so important. And in the work that I've done with studios, there's three core pillars. Three defining influences, if you like, of retention. The first one is connection. This is the relationship we're feeling. And you know when you start to see that kid and they might be on the piano bench next to you and you can just kind of feel they're getting like a bit. (sighs) Yeah, we've all had it. Totally all had it. And you just see that their energy level is kind of waning and their eyes are wandering a little bit and they're feeling that little bit like a stale. Like that is our first trigger to know, okay, I've got to mix things up. And so the connection is often the first influencer. The second pillar of retention is called uh, variety. It's variety. And that's when you've had a child who's been with you for quite a while, but, you know, maybe we've got to mix things up a bit. Maybe we've got to bring in a little bit of, you know, maybe we're going to perform as a little trio today, or we're going to do something with a forehand piece. Maybe we're going to do something totally, you know, off the wall. If, if, if we want kids to come to us for years, I want us to think about designing a lesson plan for years. You know, many of us, you know, we're very good at designing a 30-minute lesson plan. We start with a warm-up, we transition to a piece, we might do a second or third piece, we'll finish with a little kind of wrap-up at the end. Yeah, standard kind of lesson plan. Think about if I was to curate a lesson from their first lesson and my intention is to retain them for four or five years. So what would I need to do? How would I need to create? variety and interest and mix it up so that it feels fresh because they're especially when you're working with children their identity develops enormous rate throughout that amount of time you know if you're getting a kid at six and then they're with you till 10 or 12 that is a different child Mm -hmm. they've got different hopes and desires and aspirations so we have to be thinking about the sense of identity that they're bringing into the classroom and how we can really mix it up with what they're seeking so we have connection is the first one, the relationship they feel with you, the teacher, maybe also the other peers in the studio. 
and uh, even the kind of the family, the larger kind of studio community, there's kind of three levels. Then we have variety, which is kind of mixing it up. It's keeping it fresh so that they never quite know what's going to happen. And the more you can cut that little sparkle in their eye, I go, ooh, didn't see that coming. Good. It's when they're flat that we're worried. The flat line is a bad a thing to avoid. And the third one is progression. And this is the educational stretch. If we're not either meeting a child academically where they are in terms of their technique, but then extending them with the kind of things that they like, we'll also see students start to drop off. Now, this is twofold. There's the sense of progression a child identifies in themselves, feeling about how much they're connecting with the content we're teaching them at the piano. But then there's also the flip side. It's communicating progression back to parents, you know, because they're the ones who are going to put their hand in the pocket, whip out their wallets. And if the parents don't see or if if we're not educating the parent on progression, on how their child is developing, what happens is the parents then start to devalue what you're providing and they start to not see the investment as being worth it. And then if the kid comes home and says, I don't really feel like going to piano today, the parent's like, okay, well, I haven't really seen you do much anyway. (laughs) Easy to do it. So, so much of our relationship is twofold when it comes to communicating progression. It's about teaching, whoops, it's teaching the students how they're progressing and designing experiences for extension, but then also reflecting back to the parent and just like, you know, once a, you know, once a term, picking up, I just wanted to let you know that um, little Johnny today, for the first, we've been working on this for three months and right now today, little Johnny was able to play two-handed and he was able to play the whole piece from start to finish. I just wanted you to know I'm so proud and it was just so lovely. I mean, when do you ever as a parent just get a phone call congratulating you on your child? <laughs> Never. <That's right. laughs> it's always you the know? problem. It's always the yeah. problem. And so yeah. it's so easy to do. So my kind of thing about retention is sitting down and thinking about those three pillars. How can I enhance the connections we have with our students, both on an individual lesson level, but then also building friendships, which is going to help with retention? How am I bringing in, how am I mixing it up across a lesson, across a month, across a term, across a year, bringing variety into the experience? And thirdly, how can I help to communicate the progression back to the families and also really help to stretch the child and set goals and set milestones, even if we are artificially creating progression? People need to feel achievement. They need to feel that dopamine rush of going, yes, I got it. I got to this new level. It's it's gamification of education really is what we're talking about Mm. and helping them to feel like they're progressing even if we've constructed that framework ourselves. And so that's that's kind of – it's not kind of one thing but definitely three things to kind of go away and just really ponder. Go sit in a cafe, order a cappuccino, think about those three things. That's my advice. The um, communicating with parents, I was thinking I I did this really easily with one of my students the other day. Uh, One of my boys had composed a little progression uh, and he was playing a little melody. He was improvising. I played the progression on another piano. We just literally hit record on the phone and I texted that to his mum saying, listen to what Roman did today. Now that was so easy. Anyone can do that. That you know, yep. it takes no time. And I can't, I can't remember the message I got back. It was like, wow, you know, amazing. So good to hear. So that's, you know, I, I totally agree. Keeping mm. in touch with parents in that positive way is great. Uh, and we haven't got time to go into it now, but that whole idea of creating progression points, I yes. think is something I, I, I can work more on as well. And I'm going to try and put more thought into that because I think that's a real crucial thing because I also advocate Using exams, because music is obviously quite heavily exam-based, using exams Mm. in the right way and for the right kids and not necessarily just everyone. So if Mm. you don't use exams as a progression point, then there's got to be some other strategies. So I really like that you're bringing that up. So what we do with clients very quickly is we kind of tend to map out what we call the retention intention. So how we're taking them from five years old through to 16, 17, 18 years old and mapping out the entire experience with lessons sequential. Essentially, like if you think about a traditional scope and sequence of technical elements that they're going to learn at a certain age, how we can incorporate that into a progressive ascension model of learning, if that makes sense. It's a very cool topic, Tim. Mm, because, yeah. Yes. That could be very, a, f- cool a future topic. conversation perhaps. Uh, yeah. I also like that you covered variety because literally all of the stuff that I do on my blog is about the other stuff. My, you know, 95% of teachers know how to teach the classical traditional way. Yes. It's what do you do when someone like you comes along and says, you've got to, be, got to have variety and you've got to have it up your sleeve and be ready. 
Well, that's yeah. that's exactly the kind of thing that I've been enjoying creating for teachers. Uh, so I'm glad you brought that up. It's great. Yeah, it's so important. It's the little wow factor things that get people connected. And mm. that's it's also for us, I think, what keeps us on our toes. Totally. That's what brings it back the joy for us, which is so lovely. Mm. All right, well, look, we're going to start wrapping it up, but I did want to ask you a couple of questions because you yourself have made some pretty decent changes in your own business recently and you Mm. actually put an email out uh, that I really enjoyed reading with some then and nows of your last year experience. So quick couple of questions on that. One of the main things I think you've changed now, you said back then I was a team of one, you name it, I did it. I built websites, I ran Facebook ads, I coordinated events, I designed flyers. I pulled 100-hour work weeks, and you're not boasting about that because it's ridiculous, obviously. Lived on passion and coffee, but, you know, it's so easy to do, right? So now Mm -hmm. you're a team of six. Yeah. So what was the catalyst that made you go, oh, my goodness, I've got to do things differently? (laughs) Burnout with a capital B. (laughs) (laughs) Is it simple as that? So, I mean, look, I think the the beautiful thing of of the – you know, the studio expansion has just, we've been doubling every six months. So it's kind of, you know, obviously things are working, but, you know, I think especially coming from where we have been as you know, educators, like we're used to doing everything ourselves. No, I'll do it. Don't worry. I'll take care of it. Da, 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 da. And I've just had to really come to the place of, of understanding that I can do so much more profound work. I can reach more people. I can have more impact the more that I allow others to step up as well. And so the, the big change is that in the business, I now have a full-time operations manager who is just, she has been the greatest blessing in my life. We've got an online business manager. I have got, um, we've got a, direct, a director of evolution who runs one of our high level programs. We've got mentors who are delivering coaching and additional resource support to our clients. Um, we've got a full-time Filipino VA who serves and kind of delivers virtual assistant support for our clients. So they don't even have to go searching for it. We just do it for them inclusive within our programs and you know that type of thing like community managers like really just it was important to me that you know like you Tim I guess so much about the experience our members have and about their development and the results so so much of what the decisions I've made have been about giving back to what is going to provide the absolute best educational experience for our studio owners in the programs that's going to help them to excel and I've just built the business around that really I love it yeah and I, I guess those kind of roles you didn't find on Fiverr. They're kind of a little bit bigger, <laughs> bigger roles than that. Where do oh, you, yeah. Where do you tend to go to find um, find your people? Are they people that are friends of friends and you know or you go online? Uh, online, definitely, yes. So, for for example, the executive assistant operations manager, It was I did a big thing on Seek, uh, which is kind of a big job platform board, here yeah. in Australia. Yeah. And, um, and, but it actually turned out that she was the sister of one of our clients. And so it actually worked out funnily enough that way, oh, wow. but yeah. So in terms of that admin support and we have hired, as opposed to the, the mentoring, that's all been clients who've been with me for three, four years who have stepped up from, you know, they run extremely successful studios and we've systemized their businesses where they're now able to take on the kind of you know this additional role with studio expansion so they're the greatest testament to our programs too which is fun but definitely I mean starting with something like Fiverr and then Upwork is fantastic but you know for someone who is a who especially someone who's going to like take on handling inquiries or handling like leads and communication with families in your studio that type of person is someone to spend a lot of time and have a very precise job description of what you're looking for. I mean, we work very carefully with putting the right person into that role in any studio because they're going to be, they have to be efficient, but they have to be like a big warm hug. So it's this, It's this blend of finding the right person for you who's going to reflect your values of the studio, who's going to love the client so that you've got the peace of mind to know that they're on top of it and they've got the systems to support the delivery. So that's that's super essential, super essential. I think you said they were like a big warm hug. You broke up a little bit just as you said that. I, I did. Technical I like term. It. Technical term. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> well, I'm well Chantel, this has been such a great conversation. I'm sorry I've got to bring it Thanks. to an end, but uh, time has gone very, very quickly. I've personally learned heaps, uh, and I know that our listeners will have learned a, uh, a bucket load from you, and there's much more about you and what you offer online. Quickly, before we go, we've given our listeners one action step already, which was mm. to go and get Google Analytics. Google Analytics sorted for your website Uh, and if you don't know how to do it just google how do i 
set up Google Analytics and you'll find out, right? Uh, have you got maybe just two other quick, you really should do this now, steps? Look, I believe that if, if you look at the studios out there who are performing extremely well, it's not necessarily that they've got a fantastic, sophisticated marketing plan. Sometimes the best studios are the ones who have put so much love and thought into the experience. So, you know, coming back to that whole thought about how do I want people to feel? How can I add in that little sparkle? When I get a new student, how am I going to, you know, put that that little spring in their step from that first moment? What would set me apart? How can I really, really come from the perspective of wow factor? And and truly when you sit with that and then in conjunction with looking at retention, I would I would go and sit in a cafe for a day or by the beach or in a park and think about how can I facilitate and systemize connection? How can I systemize connection? Think about that. Systemize connection, systemize variety and systemize progression in the studio so that it, it is consistent without me having to do it, as well as thinking about how I want people to feel. I, you know what? I, I do believe that the best marketing, and especially in our industry, 50% of our inquiries come from word of mouth. 50% then come from online social. But 50% come from word of mouth. If you spent more time just thinking about that experience, cultivating and curating this beautiful, beautiful experience to your students, you are unstoppable. So just go back to the heart. And that's what we do so much of at Studio Expansion. We come back to our values. What do we stand for? How, what are we passionate about giving these kids? And then we craft an entire business around that. And that is where the fun begins. I love it. What a great way to finish up. Thank you so much, Chantel. Chantel and her team, uh, they've got so many resources online uh, on their website, which is Studio Expansion, E-X-P-A-N-S-I-O-N, studioexpansion.com, uh, and certainly on Facebook, very, very regular poster on Facebook and some great videos, and it's all free. Uh, so much of what you do, uh, like me, we just we want to support teachers, so happy to give it away, right? So, yeah, thank you so much for your time. I look forward to um, keeping in touch. Thank you, Tim. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And wishing everyone out there just every success in their studios and, and looking to hope forward, hopefully connecting with you one day. So thank you. So I hope you enjoyed today's interview with Chantel. Next week, we're going to be talking about professional associations and what they can do for you and your business. So I'm actually going to be chatting to Scott McBride-Smith. He's a president of the MTNA in the USA and Murray McLaughlin, who's president of the EPTA, that's the European Piano Teachers Association, uh, about the ways in which those organizations can support you, your teaching and your business. Make sure as well you check out our show notes, timtopham.com slash episode 92 for our full conversation with Chantel and a transcript you can download. Thanks, everyone. I'll see you next episode. Ladies and gentlemen, that will conclude this evening's entertainment. Oh, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. We'd love to help take your teaching to the next level as a member of our supportive community. Use the coupon Piano Podcast for $100 off an annual membership of Tim's Inner Circle today. To find out more, head to timtopham.com forward slash community.